Hello and welcome to the News Pace podcast, everybody. My name is Johnny Vadmore. You're here again to talk with someone. We're going to talk with Jason today, Jason Horsley, who's a writer. Who's you can find him on uh, Children of Job. Substack.com. Uh, Land Made Man. I like that title, landmademan.com. Um, he's a, a, a really interesting writer with some he, a, a, a load of books uh, that, that all just look like they would interest me completely. Um, I didn't realize the ones uh, that you had done before, but uh, I knew the the Kubrickon was out. Uh, but Prisoner of Infinity, uh, The Vice of Kings, Seen and Not Seen, um, and now Big Mother, the technological body of evil, which is described in very basic terms as a bold examination of artificial intelligence, consciousness, technology and the human urge to return to the womb. Um, that is a brilliant uh, w just way to start, because most of the people who listen to the Newspace podcast, uh, Jason, and, and enjoy this work that I do, are baffled, um, scared, and, well, terrified, petrified of what artificial intelligence means, what it means for the consciousness, what entering, uh, what we, we see the people entering into a cyber realm willingly. And it's very scary for, for, for everybody who doesn't feel that comfortable about the cyber realm. So, Ooh. Jason Horsley, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to having a conversation and picking your mind about a subject which, of course, like I say, not only I, but loads of people um, find very prescient now it's right on our doorstep artificial yeah. intelligence yeah how well, are you today? yeah good how are you doing johnny thanks for finally <laughs> me onto newspace um yeah this, is, this thing of artificial intelligence I mean that you just introduced with uh is it on the doorstep or is it already coming through the back door I, this is a really important question i think to start with i don't know i don't know uh, if anybody on the ground knows, certainly those, you know, the, those above Elon Musk, let's say, for simplicity's sake, presumably know and have some idea. Well, I'm not a, uh, just just to make it clear to, to you, you and the listeners, I'm not any kind of expert. I don't know anything about computers except how to use them. Um, so I'm coming at this as a layman, which is a certain sense I approach all my subjects. I, I'm not an expert in anything. I don't personally trust the experts anyway. So, But I'm also, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that I, throughout my life, I've just followed the things that interested me and got and gone as deeply into them as I could until I felt that I'd found what I was looking for and then I moved on. So each of my books is kind of a, a new departure. So I don't have a, a single discipline unless it's what I poetically termed mapping how which is trying to understand how we got in this bad situation that you and i and probably most of your listeners would agree that we've ended up in uh how we got there and and, and is there a way out how and why we got here so so big mother is to some degree the culmination of that brings together a number of different strands in my books including the one before it which was kubrickon which is kind of more that gets more into a hypothesis about what AI might be. Uh, uh, Big Mother is more about uh, it explores consciousness and what consciousness is, and then the relationship between technology on the, uh, and on the one hand, uh, discarnate entities, you know, also known as demons or jinn, that's rather speculative, and on the other hand, a sort of Freudian lens of psychology of like what I call maternal psychic bondage, uh, mother mother bondage, uh, that whole area, which I think, um, well, I'd say I have direct experience of that. Uh, no, God, yeah, we all do, uh, but um, mums, right. are, mums are often complicated, especially when you're, like, like, like for a girl, fathers are complicated, you know, it's the opposing role model, isn't it? It's, sure. Yeah. And, sure. and 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 you know it is um a, a, the further question of you know 
looking at being in the, uh, Darth Vader and, and Luke Skywalker, you know, and seeing the face of your father and it's your own face. Well, when you're looking into the face of your mother, that's something that is, is intangible. It's and un, and it's hard to, to, to understand what a woman is. It's well, that's a, that's a interesting. I mean, I can bounce right off of that uh, image that you created because it's one thing I, I talk about in the beginning of the book, A Big Mother, is how um, a child's psyche is formed, a, a sense of a psyche being a sense of self-awareness through uh, the mother's face, through gazing, gazing into the mother's face. I mean, this has been observed um, and, you know, by those of us, you know, just lay people, but also it's been clinically observed that uh, when the mother, you know, does peekaboo, for example, and the first baby's smile is mirroring the mother's smile and so on. So an infant, as infants, we are uh, unformed you know, physically and psychologically. We don't have a sense of an identity or of existing, um, except purely a somatic or a in a sense-based level, mentally, we've got no sense of existing. So that develops over the first few years. And one of the, they say, one of the, the, the key moments in that is through this um, com silent communication, what well, might not be silent, but non-verbal communication between the baby and the mother that very much does involve gazing. And uh, so, so I do start from that partly, like who we are, um, as human beings, and, and this is particularly pertinent to men, um, it really does begin in the mother's body and then in relationship to the mother's body once we come out. Of course, there are cases where the mother's absent and so on, but we just keep it simple. Um, and so the extent to that, do we develop an identity around our identification with the mother's body? or our relationship to it and our desire for it, but it can lead to identification, which is why I bring transgender into the book. Um, that's a very, um, well, it's a complex thing we don't understand, and it's a potentially perilous thing, because you don't want to be dependent on your mother your whole life. Um, and it's something that can be exploited, let's say, just to round up in a simple way. That 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 natural process, first of all, it can be... Um, it can be, uh, it can come about in ways that are not ideal. Like my mother was alcoholic and she was depressive and so on. And second of all, it can be exploited, you know, by the culture and by the, by groups and agendas that I'm sure everybody here has some sense of, uh, uh, who want to get in very early on, right? To get into the human psyche at the earliest possible stage mm -hmm. to co-opt it. And so, yeah, I, I connect that to, um, the, the, you know, social control systems, but also metaphysical ones in, in Big Mother uh, and then no, the, artificial intelligence systems. This is a culmination. Thing, the thing I find interesting, uh, one of the things I find interesting about all of that is the connection we have with that. Uh, you know those basic when you when you're talking about uh the mother's face i was thinking about my my own baby's like face when he he was younger and how how he was reacting when you talk about you know uh the womb mother the, trying to understand you know our journey these are all things we connect with of course on a personal level and then the 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 understanding of where we're going is a disconnected um photocopy of that or a poorly poorly managed photocopy of that uh i and i'm also interested in that that journey you're talking about of your own research as well which uh, later on maybe we can get into because uh, you know it's very much like you seem to like to concentrate uh on each project at a time to kind of understand that strand and then move on to the next strand you seem to be very much yeah. that person it's very interesting that that we, we you talk about the womb there and your last book was about you know the, the, the most recent book was about kubrick and you know the the you, the, the end of of course 2001 a space odyssey where you're kind of in that womb and yeah. and we all feel like this eeriness of being both akin to the monkey at the start and this godchild in the the womb at the end right. um and and that kind of never leaves us but this is you 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 seem to research within um looking towards the future from the very human 
uh, base human psychology and it's a, a, it's very it, 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 I, I tend to go into the past and look at us I'm looking in the mirror all of the time and looking at the face of, of my father or my mother all the time in my research and you seem to be propelled forward and I, I, I think we need a lot more of that because we're entering into a stage now where people aren't quite understanding how serious this is I mean even most of the people who are listening here will think they have a grasp of where this is taking us now is it, it uh, the, the disconnection of consciousness how long will something like that take before we see proper change is it already almost there uh, are, are, yeah. are most of the people who are around like disconnected from their own consciousness and do, do you then disconnect from what we would call a soul um, then I know those are very tough questions to go into. Very quickly. Yeah, they are. Uh, and there's two at once as well. Um, so I, what, Sorry. What, I, um, what you're describing is disconnection from consciousness uh, is what I refer to in Big Mother, and it was going to be the subtitle or even the title, as, as disembodiment. So that's the uncoupling of consciousness from the body. And yeah, I, I think that that does have to do, uh, or that can end up with being disconnected from the soul for reasons that maybe we can go into but very briefly because to me the only way that we can really ever experience existing as a soul as in beyond the body is is if the bo if the soul can become fully embodied if it, if if that consciousness that we think of as the soul that is eternal potentially if it can have a fully embodied experience then it has a sense of existing separately from you know the the great oversoul if you will so so yeah first first things first like trying to get to the soul or save the soul and these kind of questions um which obviously have to do with consciousness and consciousness that transcends the body the the first order of business as i see it is is to get to the body like we haven't made it to our bodies yet and i mean there are theories that and i don't know how you know how much these could be confirmed but that when a child is born, this does relate to what I was talking about just a moment ago. Um, it's yeah, it forms in the womb, and then it's then it comes out of the womb. Um, but the consciousness, the, the theory is anyway that the consciousness of that baby isn't all the way in the body for the first couple of years. That it's more kind of around the body, and so in you know sort of new age. Uh, metaphysical terms you might say it's kind of floating over like astrally over but i don't know what the specifics are but i think there's probably some some validity in that idea that consciousness isn't localized to the body in the early stages for a child for an infant uh, and that part of the development of self-awareness corresponds with that consciousness coming more and more into the body. I mean, you, you look at babies and they kind of look at their fingers and their toes and it's like, it's almost as though they don't even realize or very much as though they don't realize that's them. <laughs> Over time, they we do learn to become identified with the body, but that's, that's potentially a trap because we are, consciousness isn't restricted to the body, is at least my, my sense of it. Um, but it also... Um, just because we identify with the body doesn't mean that consciousness has, has landed fully in the body. So anyway, that was a bit long-winded, but disembodiment is how I understand the long-term plan, program of um, what I've called organized malevolence. Like whatever that is going on on this planet that uh, mythologically is described as the snake in the Garden of Eden, and there are other myths that have other kind of aromanic or satanic figures in there, but, and the Archons is a popular one, I think, in conspiracy circles now, but whatever. You know, the, the, this somehow malevolent, uh, organized influence, what's its agenda? Like I'm, you're saying that I try and project to the future. Well, part of that is, is that I'm just trying to find a unified thread that makes sense of everything sufficiently that that I can apply it right to life, and so part of that. It, so it's not either or. I'm all, I'm looking back to the distant past, but I'm also looking where are we going, and what's the common thread here? What's the driving thing? And so anyway, so I did end up with disembodiment as as one label 
for understanding this. And it seems to me that's become much more obvious in the last 20, 30 years that we are becoming more disembodied, less embodied. Um, but I, I say that it's more of a symptom. Um, like we're, because we were already disembodied, we have developed, we've been easily manipulated to develop ideologies, uh, habits, and technologies that will further our disembodiment. So it's written large now with the technology. You know, people really are more and more putting their consciousness into machines and living in machines to the point that something like the metaverse, even though it didn't work the first time out around, is is appealing to people. Like people are they're buying it they're thinking yeah that would be cool which is in itself is a symptom of something is it is it more is it like the input of um more information helps with the disembodiment or is it um uh, an agenda that is manipulated you know how much is uh, is is you know it sounds like i i'm i'm, I'm not sure i'm i'm I, I feel that the uh, it, back in the the, the day, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago, people on average would probably have been more in touch with their own consciousness, and would have probably been able to live in their own conscious more uh, consciousness with their own consciousness more, and that nowadays the more input we have, and the more we know, and the more information we put in, yeah. the more chance that 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 detachment happens that disembodiment yeah you call it. well it depends what you're knowing of course because um people over thousands of years um you know peasants let's say like for thousands of years most of humanity most human beings were peasants of one form or another there was there's always been a ruling class to some degree and you know, who have wealth and luxury i suppose even in primitive societies there were hierarchies but um but yeah, so so anyway, the 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 life of a peasant or a farmer uh, is by definition more embodied. They they do know lots of things, but they don't have this kind of ment mind based information thing. Never mind the internet and Google and so on. Um, it's 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 experiential knowledge that they need to know about the weather and the cycles of growth and, and animal husbandry and and built in you know, masonry and carpentry and all of these things they're, they're all to do with survival if you extend survival to comfort and just quality of life um and they're all as i say experience based but, but they're, they're all to do with very precise and unchanging laws of matter as i, mm. I talk about this observing the law of matter um so they don't really allow for dissociation like the more embedded you are in the natural world the more you have to just observe the laws of physical reality and learn how to get around them in the ways that you can but you can't really ever get around them but you can if you uh if you uh obey them you can dominate them this is sort of this symbiotic relationship with math so so we, we we in a sense um the people of the past would craft more and we with technology are being crafted and something's happened yeah that. that's very much in the big mother thesis like at, at what point did the technology the tools we create did they start to turn the tables on us so that we became the tools of the tools that we created so i even take it back to fire like to what extent did our dependence on fire um reduce well first of all kind of it it might have led to projecting onto that fire something that qualities it didn't really have like thinking that it was god or that worshiping fire let's say in some way uh, and that's an obvious way of disempowerment um, but second of all just more profanely to what extent did human beings become dependent on fire therefore less resourceful in terms of keeping warm or surviving on food without fire so even fire you could make an argument that we weakened our spirit by discovering fire you could right so but if you say <laughs> flash forward thousands of years it's like 2001 space odyssey uh, then you end up with smartphones where i think it's clear it's that indisputable that 99 percent of what i don't have one by the way but what you're getting from your smartphone through it is it's not useless that would be saying it too far but it's not essential it's inessential mm -hmm. and it's not um 
it's not helping you to become more connected to physical reality. You know, I had to specify that because it is useful for connecting to other human beings, for example. Um, so it, obviously it has its uses. We're using it now that are positive. But um, if they're vastly outnumbered by the not positive ones, which as we all know, like the internet was created by DARPA. Not everybody knows that, but it's a tool of the controlling you know, the ruling classes, um, then we're constantly being, um, you know, sold to and tricked and deceived and snared and all the rest of it. So then, and part of that is, I'm just saying the main part or one part is that we're just ingesting all kinds of useless information or inessential stuff that's causing us to disconnect. But the other thing I just wanted to, to end on was that, um, it's the medium itself that we're spending more and more time actually interacting with machines, putting our attention, our energy, our life force into the machine. And that's, uh, you see, with fire or other things, that, that seems fairly healthy. Like if you just spend your, your whole night staring at the fire, the rest of the tribe might think you're a bit weird and you might get a bit lazy. But but still, you're you're in this symbiotic relationship with something that was created directly by life. But these technologies, they got they're sort of some intermediary liminal space, um, and so yeah. So this is I said I was going to end on that, but actually I'll just add another thing, which is this is part of my thesis of what AI is. It's machines that are created by uh, human beings who are themselves semi possessed by the tools and the technology um, as a means to keep siphoning off our consciousness, keep uncoupling our consciousness from our physicality. And the, where does that consciousness go? It goes, it goes into the machine. Like I so yeah, I suppose the fire didn't um, benefit massively from our interaction, but uh, the machines benefit enormously from our interaction, from keeping our gaze. And and so eventually, once AI comes in, it, it all or the computers are uh, are going to be trained to keep your gaze and that's what we're, we're we're seeing is that that that's where the difference i mean you chose to give your gaze to fire um but this is more of an addiction now i i, I sometimes i stare at i i stare at um things people watch in horror at times not because i'm any better or i watch better stuff it's, it's because probably because my work, like your work, is going to be very research intensive. Um, and so you spend a lot of time reading and taking in things that you need to take in to advance yourself and your knowledge. And the majority of the Internet is not people advancing your knowledge. When you were saying there that, you know, it's a it is very much a waste of time and all you're doing is inputting to the machines so they get more data and more data and the machines in the future will be able to disseminate the data of the past so as long as they keep bringing data um that means that they're they, they're going to keep improving um especially as we i mean what we're seeing at the moment is there's really bizarre stuff um happening we are right on the precipice of that change right now mm. um people don't realize how much is upon us um i i i i was um i started the year off with a bit of a bang i got into some big what are called i don't know if you knew that twitter got taken over by x and then x become i got got this thing called spaces and it's run by this lovely guy called elon musk who only has the best interest for you at least that's what x tells me yeah. uh, <laughs> and and i started off the year by being uh invited into a space um to talk and these spaces are like public forums you know they 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 seem very beneficial everybody's you know you've got a a panel of maybe 32 people sitting there um speaking politely mostly and then uh in these rooms i mean we had millions of people over the the period you know listening and it, it feels very nice it feels like humans getting together um but right at the start there was an account you'll like i think you'll enjoy the story and this would be it's it's, it's useful there was an account called Adrian Dittman. 
And the person who said you should go and ask if you can get into that space. Uh, and it was a central Epstein file space. And I'm an Epstein expert. So so I ended up being like fairly central to the whole thing. They they used me to go and talk with other people and to, to control conversations, which seemed mm. very interesting. Um, they knew how to use me. But this one account, Adrian Dittman, we were both sure, me and the person, that it was Elon Musk at first that it was Elon Musk's sock account. It sounded like Elon Musk. Uh, the speech patterns were kind of like Elon Musk, but with a tint of a, like, a slightly more British accent, just slightly more, like it, like it's almost uh, a little bit fake. And it, But there was something that didn't feel right, uh, mm. didn't feel human about it. And as times developed, I started watching this account more. Now, the other day, Jason Bamas, a very good uh, researcher, came out and said, wow, look at this Adrian Dittman account. Um, what is it? Because it sounds like it's Elon Musk. Um, uh, but when you actually investigate further, me and um, someone else behind the scenes were chatting about this for a while. And we started to think that maybe this was these spaces were actually um, a scraping, like a data scraping exercise for AI. Mm -hmm. And that some of the people who are interacting in there are no longer human. Right. They're really high level, run by Grok or one of the AI systems like that. Mm. Really high level. Uh, and uh, it's indistinguishable from human, apart from it seems like the conversation is always a conduit to um to to another person or another action it was all, always to get things moving. It never becomes too much essential. It gets very awkward. Um but how close are we? Are we are we already there? Are we already at the point where there's no return? Because I know you 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 live far out uh, away from uh, the world uh, the world from most of this technological sort of revolution that's happening. Sort of. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. And no one gets away with it fully. I'm right in the center. You know. I feel, I feel, I look around and people aren't there anymore. They seem disembodied. They seem detached from yeah. themselves. Um, uh, and what, what's the progression in your view? I know that's a quick, like a, a big question to go on to. But well, yeah, I mean, what... it's two things. I mean, one is it because you're talking about online interaction in an in environment of online, which of course has been created. Um, somewhat with this in mind i suppose but anyway it's a testing ground for ai let's say you know, even in the early days of the internet i think i had this idea okay well this is how they would create ai is they create a landing pad and then they get as much consciousness as possible to focus on it and then that consciousness is a kind of um well, i've got the right analogy it's like a wind tunnel or something through which this AI consciousness can land. Anyway, that was quite poetic, fanciful, but the Kubrickon is, is pretty much that thesis and it has to do with capturing people's attention and it has to be a particular kind of attention and then, yeah, and then harvesting it, harvesting it and then recycling it, let's say. So, so there so has to be a symbiosis, like AI as I see it, has to be a symbiosis between machine intelligence in quotes which is an oxymoron in my view. There's no such thing as machine intelligence. There's machine, um, maybe something like cognition, right? If machines can play chess, there's something where, and that's in 2001 as well, where they can make decisions, but they're not decisions based on sentience. They're decisions based on kind of reaction, deduction reaction. I'm just improvising now, so I could probably get caught out very quickly by an expert, but but just trying to give a sense of, of what I mean anyway. There is a difference. I could, actually, if you, if you look in nature, you can see that the animals like chickens or even cats, they are quite mechanical. Uh, uh, you know, they have personality in that, but, but essentially you'll notice they'll do the same physical movements over and over again and the exact same physical movements that any other chicken or any other cat. So there is a kind of mechanical element to nature, um, which uh, includes, uh, so sentient beings can, they are partly mechanical, let's say. Well, output uh, attracts input. I suppose. So, you know, the uh, expression of human life attracts something towards it. Right. Well, so 
So, and what's the difference between uh, this kind of machine-like way of being that we see in animals and human beings? Potentially, I'd say it's this this idea that we have of the soul, and the soul has to do with with real sent, you know, deep sentience, self-awareness, sentience plus self-awareness. Let's say, and and that's what the it could say that's what the machine covets, but that doesn't really make sense because the machine doesn't really want anything. But something, including human beings, some human beings want to somehow capture this special soul sentience that human beings have and trap it in the machine somehow. So uh, anyway, I was saying, so there's two, there's two angles. One is uh, the life on the internet, in which case <clears throat> it's relatively easy for a bot to pass the Turing test because we don't have the usual, as human beings, we don't have the usual gauges by which to tell if it's human or not. Like if it's just text, you've got nothing. Like there must have been text, uh, you know, bots passing for human beings for, for decades, probably, actually. And then it's extended to telephone switchboards now. I think many times you're on a switchboard and you don't realize it's a machine. As far as I know, that's true. Um, so this is to do with we're not getting enough information as human beings to tell. So, of course, if you make, um, you can make it a lot easier for a bot to pass the Turing test if you reduce the number of uh, the amount of stimuli by which we tell, right? So if you if you remove face to face interaction from most interactions, then it's a lot easier for machine intelligence to pass the Turing test. The, there probably aren't actually synthetic robots walking around just yet. I can't rule it out. Could be, but let's say that 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 hasn't come to pass. But on the internet, uh, certainly with voice. But even now with deep fake and CGI, we don't know how advanced that is, right? To create, like I could be talking to a, a Johnny Redmore bot now. I have to acknowledge that it's possible. The technology, beep beep, yeah, yeah. Right? the technology might be uh, available. Um, and I think I trust that there are ways that I would be able to tell, but that might be naive, you know, presumptuous on my part. So anyway, so that's the first area. As I say, kind of, yeah, all bets are off at this point. We're, we're kind of we're, we're off the reservation or off the map we really don't know we just have to trust in our own discernment and keep developing it and keep questioning is this a human being is this a human being second thing is actually in real life away from keyboard these people who are these people i mean those of us who are more and more immersed in the technology i'm just doing my hand swiping uh, imitation now but um <laughs> What's going on with them? Like they're becoming less and less sentient and aware of what's going on in their environment. And they're being more and more, as we saw with, can I say the word C-O-V-I-D? I don't know, or M-R-N-A. But anyway, as in what's I think you can now. If Nigel Farage is allowed to say it, then everyone's allowed to say okay. it. Okay, <laughs> because uh, I know you use YouTube still. Uh, I know Google has stopped saying that it's not evil, so we know it's definitely... Uh, anyway... Um, <laughs> Uh, as we've seen, yeah, people are becoming more and more possessed by propaganda, by information, false disinformation, which is why Davos said the number one enemy this year is disinformation, because that's their number one tool, right? So uh, symmetrical. Um, so, yeah, people who are more and more dependent on technology to get their uh, sense of what's going on in the world, and they're by the same token, really, um, because of the platforms that they're directed towards by the technology, such as Facebook or New York Times or whatever it is, uh, they're becoming more and more easily and more and more fully possessed by the propaganda. So I would say those people, that those humans, by definition, are becoming less and less sentient. So then the question mark that Big Mother looks at is, well, what what enters in where human sentience or soul consciousness is no longer able to go something else enters in there so then we have this thing of n n uh, c n non-player characters npcs which has become a trope on the internet um of necessity i'd say like uh are the real are the human beings around walking around among us who are npcs they're walk-ins right they're not they don't have sentient. They're being run by AI in quotes. But so, what is AI? Right? We haven't got to that yet. Exactly. What well, you're saying, they, 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 the physical, uh, 
um, born of nature, humans uh, are, are kind of switched off to a degree that they're all of their um, they're being propelled by AI. They're being propelled by their computers. They're being propelled by their technology. So they become uh, equivalent to one of the bad Grand Theft Auto NPCs that would walk into a wall and just do. I mean, that that's really essentially it, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that, that's certainly part of it. That's the part that I was beginning with. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in the pro program behavior, and we're all. We're all that to some degree. Like you can't be have been born in the last hundred years, I'd say, or at least since <laughs> World War Two, uh, without having right, been installed with a program very early on. Yeah, no, I don't think in uh, history, uh, throughout history, even tribal history, you you, you get um, a different type of uh, programming from your community, and you accept a certain amount of that. Um, but then you can choose not to play the game but then you get zeros and ones you see i i kind of you know i can understand why it's so easy for machines to be able to um will be able to process this information they're all about zeros and ones um and that is very much i think how i see uh interactions happening nowadays i see it very um uh, becoming more machine-like as it uh, as it goes on. I do a lot of walking around with a camera in city centres and talking with people. And I find that I talk with so many people in hotels over the years, I've kind of understood that people react with either a zero or a one. You know, it's easy to make it a by, a, but you know, you have yeah. a positive and negative. And if you get a negative and a positive, it usually ends with a negative. So you don't, you know, if I'm walking down the street being positive. Every time I meet a zero, I'm like being a one. I'm not saying that's amazing, but I'm just being purposely being positive, purposely being polite, purposely being social. Yeah. Um, and and I meet a zero, then we just that that's all of the possibility within that interaction just disappears straight away. But if I meet another one, then suddenly uh, uh, it's an expression of life. Everybody's smiling, talking, and suddenly it's you know it's like human is there again. So I I start to feel that that a lot of these people who are turning off off to technology right now and turning to technology uh, 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 are, are, are mainly living their life with an output of zero all of the time you know um and and that's the submission that's uh, the same submission that may be noted in things like the milgram experiment etc you know where, where you just humans submit to the all-knowing uh, as the, the all-knowing creature it doesn't have to be a human that if if they think it's all knowing enough and it's above them then they will submit to it yeah. uh, it, it doesn't that doesn't isn't that going to be the majority of people who submit i would say somehow by definition it, it is the majority i'm not sure if i can explain that why it is but i guess because we're talking about passivity and uh there's something about being non-passive and b being autonomous that equates with an ability and a willingness to separate from the herd. So, so somehow by definition, those who go along are always going to be in the majority because what they're going along with is the majority, the tide. So that does seem to be just baked into the experiment, quote unquote. Maybe this relates back to the difference between human and animals, because animals, it's okay for them to be heard. I mean, not all animals are heard animals, actually, but even wolves go in packs. Cats are very independent. But anyway, it's okay for some animals to be heard animals because they are herd animals. Human beings, well, I don't think they're animals at all, actually, but they have an animal side, of course, and certainly uh, we weren't created, if I can use that phrase, to be herd animals. So there's something about the creation of the the, the herd human being, again, that as we've seen with COVID. primes people for disembodiment, it like primes oh, that, people. Yeah, it's, but... it's inseparable from this disembodiment. That is inherently satanic. It's an inversion. Like a human being somehow is supposed to be, it's not an island, it's the opposite of an island, actually, because a human being is supposed to be connecting everything to everything, I think. And so we are we are connected to each other, but somehow 
I'm sure there's a there's an analogy here. It is about a bit like north and south and binary actually that you know north and south pole in order to function as poles they have to be separate. So there's something about human beings to really function as a connection to other human beings, we have to have some separation. If you actually just cram us together, there's no possibility of connection, which is what we're seeing. People are more and more cramming together and more and more hurting, but they're also more and more isolated in their own bubbles, which is a weird mm. paradox. But the, oh. what reconciles it is that their bubbles are being informed by a monocultural, monolithic message. Right? It's coming through all the nodes, like the pod people in the matrix. I, I, I would assume that a lot of people are turned off by human... Oh, they, they they have a choice between human interaction and indulging in um, whatever they they seem to burst into their mind when they, they're using their devices. Yeah. And that human interactions potentially like doing a, a brain workout, like actually going for a run. You know, the people, and I'm not one of those people, one of those people who get out and go, oh, I, I'm going to go for a run for a few hours now, and, you know, sort out my body. Uh, but a lot of people, I, I mean, I suppose when you're talking with people, you're doing that with your mind. When you're interacting with people in, in the real world, you're, you, a lot more sparks are happening in the brain than if you're in, interacting uh, through messaging, uh, you know, um sure and, and... it's more confrontational it's more in your face uh it's what you also well what i was saying about matter you know farmers they have to interact with matter directly and constantly push against it find out the limits also what you were saying about the difference between you and i and uh, and many people who use the media is where we have this creative interaction with it where we're constantly finding ways we can use the information um and and um, use it as raw material to make new discoveries. That's similar also. Like there's a constant testing of the limits of knowledge and awareness. Is it true? Is it false? That yeah, human interaction. Uh, ideally, I mean, if in its natural form, if people aren't just you know constantly checking their smartphones or any other forms of avoidance, it it has this same quality. You you can't just fall back on a script. You have to actually, uh, is this person listening? Are, are they responding? Am I getting through? And so you're finding out things about yourself by bouncing off the other person, right? not just in discussion, but just everything. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transference of, of awareness. So that's, yeah, that that's our potential and that's our natural optimal state. And I think this relates to what you're saying about the zeros and ones, because I, I thought that was actually an interesting point, because what I'm uh, something I'm looking into now, narratives, that we are part of the propaganda and the way the symptom of being propagandized is that we always want good and evil stories. We want to know who's good and who's evil so we can identify with the good and despise the evil. And that's so crippling, actually. It's so pervasive. In through, if you look at World War II history, you know, that's the, like, I was just reading that's the formative myth of our culture, actually. The origin myth of our current culture goes back to World War II. And you have the ultimate evil, and therefore you have the ultimate good. Um, but if you just look into World War II, it's simply not the case. I won't, I won't don't worry, I won't take us there. But you, you, you can if you want. I'm, right. I'm into that sort of stuff. Okay. But yeah, the point being that it's just false anyway. Right? I mean, well, I will make the point. The people who look into World War II history, they often fall into the trap of flipping it. They go, oh my God, what I thought was ultimate evil wasn't, and what I thought was ultimate good wasn't. So it must be the other way around, right? And so they actually do become... the, the classic fallacy. Cla yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I, it's like the repulsion of the thing that as you've noticed you're in a cage, you're repulsed by the cage, so you get into another cage, and then you're yeah. like, oh, I got out of that cage. Oh, it's a horrible cage. I, I, I feel this, and I feel, I, I feel the amount of knowledge I've like gathered and really only in the past four or five years i always thought i knew about the war um then i went through that journey that you're talking about where i went over to to watch all of the things that i wasn't supposed to watch and went oh god it's nothing's like and all the things i'm not supposed to listen to nothing's like it's meant to to be it turns out all of these people were really nasty but that doesn't make hitler and the boys and the gang nice it doesn't and i i 
I went and watched something uh, just yesterday, um, a, a movie uh, that's known as some, one of the most anti-Semitic movies of all time. Um, it had come up in an article uh, uh, in um, uh, one of the Black Hand series where I'm investigating a woman called Esmeralda Goulan and her... Um, the brother was a uh, Campbell Goulan, was a famous actor in the, the 30s and a producer, movie maker. And he made a movie called Juden Sus and, uh, or Jusus. And it oh, was yeah. about um, a, a Jewish guy called Sus who's. Um, it, it it was the, the first one, the original one with Campbell Goulan starring in. Um, that movie was no, known as a philo-Semitic movie. So it was like pro-Jewish because they were, you know, there was so much negativity happening that there was an automatic propaganda response from the West, of course, to try and make this philo-Semitic movie. And then uh, Goebbels recreated, like funded the recreation of it in 1940, of uh, Jusus, and it's known as one of the most anti-Semitic movies of all time. And I thought, I never actually watched it. I, I, you know, I've been told so much about how much it is, you know, how terrible it is. Yeah. And I should go watch it to, to, to see if it's true. And I watched it properly yesterday and I was just a, 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 a amazed. It was a really quality movie. It had some really edgy bits in it, like really raunchy bits. Uh, for, for, for It was really like, you know, in general, well-made. I would never call it the most anti-Semitic movie of all time, but it is very uh, anti-Semitic, of course, because it's underlying. It's what the, at that time they'd all sides are creating myths that that will control the people and they're doing it in ways that have just been taught to them or just they've just discovered it, it from from people like lenin so you've got like leninist propaganda was so um it, it came out in different cultures in loads of different ways in some in in uh russia and and soviet culture uh it was look brother we have this propaganda spread it to people this is and they basically didn't hide that it was lies they, everybody who got the next one would be like spread this propaganda brother and you know it would just be spread the information and and make people think this way because that's what we've got to do to create change so everybody was aware that they were being manipulated where when that came up in fascist ideology or the west it started to become a subversive we're going to introduce propaganda quietly Shh, don't tell anybody we'll do it through intelligence and we'll we'll we'll, we'll put it out in the movies and we'll make people think a different way yeah. and i think that was the side that won World War Two because yeah. it was the most effective and yeah. yet not 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 the best. So um, yeah. I, no, I, yeah, I would agree. Um, and to bring it back to a general point, um, yeah, the problem with propaganda that's that's under the radar that way that just slips in and and, and we can't distinguish it from real information uh, isn't simply that it's false in itself. Um, but because it over time it uncouples us from reality so like, like the more and this is why i was making the point about world war ii because there's practically no one alive now who was born before world war ii who was around to remember it um and so that means to me because like, that to, it seems as though that was the biggest disinformation campaign ever actually in the history of the world really uh was was world war ii and the way it was rewritten afterwards and so um, that means that we were all born into a sea of lies. We were born into a narrative that was essentially a distortion, false, illegitimate. And and because it was such a foundational narrative, right? as in that's how we gauge good and evil. We look, Nazis bad, Churchill good. My God. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, and then well, we mentioned the Jews, I mean, we just have, but innocent victim, therefore good, and uh, and so on. But... Mm -hmm. But reference points that are mythical, let's say, just to keep it kind of neutral, they're mythical. You know, sure, maybe the Nazis were pretty bad. Maybe most of the Jews were quite innocent. And maybe the Allies did do some good, whatever. You know, There's, there's elements of truth uh, in there, but it doesn't really matter because the main narrative is a mythical narrative that is a, a profound distortion of reality and that it gets uh, incepted in us. Like I, you and I, we were born... Um, into the culture where our parents 
unquestionably accepted that narrative, even though they were around to see some of that, and then passed it on to us. So I don't know what the analogy would be, but I think it is kind of close to, to what we've been talking about with AI. You create a, um, like this landing pad or this main frame, and out of that main frame, you generate a consciousness. That was the AI hypothesis. But that's also the uh, what I'm saying about human consciousness, that main frames get created by the, you know, like Orwell says, those who control the present control the past, those who control the past control the future. Those those forces, they create the main frame for human consciousness. And it is always binary. It's always binary, and you'll always be wrong. It's not like ones are better than zeros. They're both, if you're a one, you're just as stuck, as you said, with these cages, as if you're a zero. You have to be both a one and a zero, which means neither a one nor a zero, which is, I don't know what, right? It's We're off the map again. Two. <laughs> to <laughs> I, I so it's 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 very much it's it's very much comes down to like um uh, game theory as well and the things that led us to uh, algorithmic i uh, idea of algorithms ai computing all of this you know um they all i i, I wonder if it's a race to our own destruction or something we can't um avoid you know uh but yeah i don't want to I, I don't want to necessarily come off that what you're saying there about the creation of of myths because we're just creating a new myth for ourselves. i mean that post-world war creation of uh, mythos creation uh wasn't just about the war either it was about things like the 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 frontier men going out and taking america uh by force off the indians you know it, 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 westerns were the most popular thing to watch because it gave people a foundational narrative to say yeah. you're not bad people you're not related to bad people but the truth was also you're not bad people if you knew if you knew you know you, you're you're number one you're not your ancestors uh but number two your ancestors thought they were doing the right thing uh, at that time because that's what the narrative was telling them so they weren't necessarily wrong but they weren't necessarily right they were somewhere where else and we got we we yeah i i i one one thing that i came across in my research was this idea of how america saw themselves post world war 2 which was like this big soulless behemoth um and that makes me think of ai it's almost like the American actions at post World War Two have been almost indistinguishable from what compute. It's like it's like the route to it, it, uh, automation taking over completely, and uh, intelligence taking over. So, yeah. have we already in our societies parcelled up the parts of AI, what well, AI will do, and we're already been doing them for the past seventy five years. I, I had a thought there, I'm not sure if I'll be able to, I'll have to improvise to get it out, but it has to do with like a fear of evil and of darkness, a fear of doing the wrong thing, like our ancestors, right, of getting it wrong. Somehow that creates the idea of being mechanized. That makes that idea more and more appealing. Somehow, like if we can just get it down to a science, like what's the right thing and the wrong thing, and we'll just program ourselves so we'll never ever do, you know, never again. We'll never do this terrible thing. But basically, you have to cut yourself off from your primal nature because violence, um, you know, uh, brutal sexuality, uh, rage, uh, well, disease and death, they're all just part of nature. You can't, we can't actually create some environment in which we're protected from external evils or internal evils. The only way to do it is let's mechanize the fuck out of everything. I mean, this was H.G. Wells's vision, I think, and Bertrand Russell's Scientific Society. I know I remember reading H.G. Wells when I was quite young, and, and him saying, I think it was a novel even, but, oh, yeah, we'll create a society where we'll get rid of this, that, and he included wolves in there. And it struck me, wow. even young, I'm like, my God, you want to get rid of wolves? Wow. I, I don't understand if it's ticks and mosquitoes, but... But no, he's going to, and okay, you know, fair enough, if you're going to be practical, this is the point, really. If you're going to be pragmatic, you've got to get rid of everything that just threatens yes, comfort yes. and convenience. But then that, that extends to the inner realm as well. You've got to cut off the soul because the soul is the most unpredictable thing. You've got to traumatize. Because the soul will connect with the wolf. 
Yeah, the soul is connected to nature, needs to connect to nature in the primal, um, and and have that raw, uh, you know, unfiltered experience and expression. You know, you know, children. I was going to make a point about children as well. Why children are so uh, targeted in this society? Because of course they are just naturally connected to the primal and nature. They don't have the filter of conscience mm -hmm. slash morality. So you know, traumatize them, circumcise them, turn them into machines. Uh, anyway, and then the last thing that occurred to me in all this is kind of ironic that this is in 2001 as well, That except it's the, the reverse in a way, because it's it's both actually, because how, well, the problem with how, and this is my thesis for Kubrickon, which is that Kubrickon, when he was working on 2001, he realized that this was a real problem. How do we create AI in such a way that it won't deduce rationally that human beings need to be removed for the same reason that H.G. Wells wanted to get rid of wolves, because they threaten the natural stability of the system, right? So he, he saw that, this is my thesis, he saw this as a problem that was more interesting than making movies. So after that, he dedicated his life secretly to how do you create an AI that won't destroy humanity? So, so there's the two things in there, right? Because, of course, AI does, I mean, hell does go mad and kill the humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, precisely, I suppose, because he was created in such a way as to, as I'm saying, to, to protect human beings. This is in Asimov's, actually, Three Laws of Robotics, isn't it? Um, why create AI, AI if it isn't to protect us or serve us? protect and severe. But if you do that effectively, it will end up destroying us because it will see that we're our worst enemy. <laughs> and also and also that it will learn that it can create as well because it's we've given it all of the tools to be able to create. And then suddenly, you know, what creations come from something that's so detached from humanity. Um yeah. Yeah, God, there, was a, there was a, a a few things going on there that I was thinking because you're talking about um I don't know if Bertrand Russell was I was suppose he was um I know I know H.G. Wells was but the, the, uh, but these guys were Fabians these guys were about like yeah. a slow yeah. slow careful introduction and uh, it, it also I mean whenever we have stories that lead round to Kubrick I. I really it it became very clear to me in my my research on Herman Kahn of the Hudson Institute mm. um that that he and Kubrick I mean uh, Ku, Ku, uh, Herman Kahn denied that he was the real Dr Strangelove as it was but I mean it was pretty clear that he was one of the many facets from different famous characters in the, the uh, like uh, nuclear mutually assured destruction perpetual warfare sort of uh, scene of the late 50s and early 60s he was one of many characters that was used to create Dr. Strangelove but um, it, uh, Khan himself said oh no Kubrick told me himself that I'm not the actual you know and, and if I was my wife would be angry with him and he seemed to have a very both Herman Khan and Kubrick started I think to concentrate on that during the late 60s and 70s a lot more it kind of like it, I think I think they there was the people who know who can map out who can model realize where this is going and it can only lead surely it can only lead if you're not switched off and uh, like the di disembodied detached mentally and just in the technology um then then you can't help but to see that this is obviously going to have a negative effect on humans because we become the lesser life the lesser there you go life yeah. uh because because we're talking about now okay this is a really good uh, set uh, like place you for for there's three stages of ai so there's artificial narrow intelligence where we are now artificial general intelligence and artificial mm. supreme intelligence or something along those lines mm. and of course these uh are, are supposed i mean it's it's theorized because there's it could just be artificial narrow intelligence all of the way down and it's just very complicated versions of that look indistinguishable from magic um do you think that we're round the corner from something which is like how 
do you think that that's like exp like exponential so it once ai teaches itself is self-learning then yeah. it can't help but to get there at great speed um i suppose it's in there but well there's two things that come to mind right where one is is that you know if i'm half right about kubrick or at all right i mean um how was the model of how not to go and kubrick working with khan and minsky and whoever else behind the scenes at darpa was focusing on a very different thing like 2001 showed this is not the kind of ai we want right because we don't want it to destroy humanity indiscriminately <laughs> right uh, um so that's one thing i've forgotten what the other thing was now but um uh i mean i think ai is like it's like the alien invasion same you know acronym um it has to come through the back door so so there's certainly maybe of course the, you can't avoid the people in silicon valley and elsewhere who grew up on star trek in 2001 who are trying to create ai just in this rather conventional fashion albeit with the internet being an obvious you know, algorithms and all that, actually using human consciousness, that is, that's uh, acknowledged to some degree. All of that's going on. Um, but, and it's not necessarily uh, separate from this other agenda, which I have to posit in Big Mother isn't primarily human. It's only secondarily human, uh, which is, which is the, um, there's already an intelligence which isn't artificial, but it's inorganic. There's already an intelligence that wants in and it wants access to the human body. So then this isn't about um, that machines will take over and destroy human beings exactly. It kind of is, but it's not the way we think it is and the way the movies have shown it. It's that this intelligence is taking over and it's co-opting the human body it's turning the human body into a vessel for itself by making it part machine i mean or one of the side effects of that and the means to that is to make the human body mechanistic uh, figuratively but also literally with nanotechnology and and whatever other ways in which actual technology is getting going inside the human body and or, i mean who knows with you know, synthetic food additives, obviously the vax, the fake vaccine, uh, what may or may not be in chemtrails and 5G and so on. We know that the human body is under attack, uh, consciously, you know, intentionally or not. Statistically, but, definitely it shows, I mean, health statistics show it, uh, the rates in autism, et cetera, and, and lots of other uh, other uh, factors and increases in all ill health. I I, I, I started to, uh, you know, have to look at the fundamentals of everything I thought I believed because we, 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 we're going under constant uh, attack of our own, uh, of what we've been taught because what we've been taught where did we get taught from we got taught by people who are creating these same machines uh to subjugate us so they 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 come from a place of subjugation and the machines will come out of a place of subjugation because the only people who can afford to create supreme artificial intelligence will be uh funded by raytheon and all of these other big military contractors so i mean that's i i'm I, I'm I it's the impulse when you're having a conversation like this with someone who understands it is is to ask the question like, oh, how far away are we? How far you know? Um I, I've tried to explain to people I think that in the next five years we'll watch rooms full of what we think are people talking, but they'll just be bots talking to each other and yeah. even the bots won't know that they're bots so so you know it won't, won't know each other about so, so and they they don't they don't know anyway i mean the the whole idea of knowledge and you're trying to work out how a computer thinks and then we end up in this very um uh like we have a very monolithic belief we have very mono we we have very we have this idea that once sentience happens within um a computer that you have how and everything is then how because it's because it's a computer but that's not quite the way it is do you see i think the better question would do you see different forms of intelligence arising from artificial 
this what what is being created now well say intelligence i mean as i said at the beginning I, i'm just not i'm not an expert on any of this stuff like i i got my own understanding and and then the theories that come from that understanding but they're not really predictive um and i i don't actually see i mean to me the the only prediction that's reliable it's kind of what, what all said or a variation on it perhaps a more benign variation is if you understand the present you will you will you will know what the future is going to look like if you understand the past you'll be able to understand the present and if you understand the present you'll have a sense of what the future holds mm -hmm. like the thing that gibson's william gibson said um the future's already here it's just not fully distributed yet that that's a really succinct way of putting it uh, mm -hmm. these things aren't as linear as we think they are it's not like there's a discovery or an invention and boom something it's not like the aliens show up on the white house lawn and boom they're here i don't really believe in aliens by the way but i think it's a useful metaphor yeah yeah same here yeah um, um uh, I, I so yeah. the distribution speeds up yeah it's because, a distribution um, so then it's more and that has to do with awareness like whitley strieber who i thoroughly deconstruct with prisoner infinity um but nonetheless you know, there's significant information in there even if it's misre misrepresented to create this alien abduction narrative he has this theory realization that the visitors as he called them will only arrive through the corridor of our own minds and that they have to generate belief in them in order to be able to materialize mm. here now to me that's a too new age and it's too it's kind of a it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because it it's actually makes it more credible and you do start to believe right so it's he's he's playing a weird game there but uh it's true of technology people who believe that technology is possible they, they could go on to invent it so that's a much more profane example um and the point is yeah that technology the technology that one day manifests or metastasizes as the computer was around you know, back the days of the abacus right it's already there it's just it's not you know it takes time for it to really its tender tendrils to really um extend into every level of society now as in the case of the alien takeover the point that we realize that the aliens are among us it'll be too late because at that point clearly they're walking they're confident enough to let them let us notice you know they're, they're so prevalent you can't help but spot them right so i'd say we're already too late in this regard if you haven't noticed that we as a species and our consciousness has been being taken over if you haven't noticed it yeah i mean post covid for god's sake it's too late right so 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 it's so what's the why look into the future really because the future is here it's the future like the future our future is is right now like by the time i finish this sentence we are in our future it's not you know so so instead just you know look at what's going on now uh that's a more important question how how much have we been able and willing to notice right what's going on with ai to keep it specific on that point go to bleating there um how much have we noticed that in the present because because that's that's the critical question not no, it's, it's, soon or when it's going to happen I, it's very interesting at the time we're having this conversation the goat was bleating in the background yet yeah, i could not hear it because zoom has taken it out he's taken out the natural sound uh from a distance yeah. it's filtered it uh, it's learned how not to loud, take but... some uh, but still it yeah, i didn't out. even hear the little bit of it because that, that i mean if i cough on here or something it'll cut it out if i if i play instruments on here it'll cut it out yeah. um it, it's it's very much the computers are saying oh to to be focused we need to be more computer like and we need to have that you know uh, well we say that we create this so right. when you say uh -huh. um do you know so it, it seems like a very negative like proposal that we are already in the future so it's too late 
in a sense, because and I think it is because you look around and you see that I, I explain to people that, you know, young global leaders scheme and stuff. People are going, oh, my God, they created all these leaders. And it's been going on since the 50s. And, you know, you can map all of the progression. It's just a distribution of it got more and more. At first, it was just 50 people at Harvard. Then it was 200 people. Then it was now it's thousands going through the system, you know, and, and that all of these sort of things happen all the way around the place so we're, we're very we're very late to the party what's the change how can we possibly i mean that's obviously what cries out how can we possibly stop people from indulging in what we cannot um replace in input you know, we can't we can't create the same enticement in the real world. It seems to to to, to get that these people get in their smartphones that they're just constantly stuck in their phones all of the time. Mm. How do we how do we uh, counteract that? Are, are we? Is it too late? Is this is this the the point where humanity is about to lose itself? And is that why? Just to to go on, is that why we've never seen aliens? Oh, well, that's about that last thought. Um, I mean, how to tie that in there? But as far as the you know the, the bulk of what you said, I, I don't have children, so I don't. I've got a niece, but my niece is very savvy. You know, she's her 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 uncle's niece, and and so although I didn't raise her, I was around enough, and obviously other factors. Just she's innately born with the right qualities, I would say. So she is what I call paranoid aware. She's nobody's fool. Um, so I'm not too concerned about her. Um, in a way, uh, this might come out wrong if I keep it simple, but in a way, I could say I'm not really concerned about anyone, i.e. I'm not really concerned about the human race, and not because I don't think it's going down the tubes. I think it probably is, you know, these, these cybernetic tubes. Um, but because I think that the idea of a human race is part of this myth that's been created uh, in part of the mainframe of the myth that's been created to capture our consciousness i'm not saying there isn't such a thing as a human race i'm just saying that we have a word for it like god that we don't actually know what that means like what does that mean the human race like we've got statistics and numbers and races and cities and maps and things but unless you've met all these people, how can you say right, exactly what, right? So, so I leave that one open in terms of, you know, are all 8 billion statistical uh, names on the, I presume they're on books somewhere. I presume somebody's checked that, that that number's backed up by names and let's say in social security numbers. But how do we know that they're actually real human beings? We don't. Even if they're real physical humans, how do we know that they're sentient? We don't, and so on. So, so I just leave that open. I only concern myself with those I am engaging and interacting with. Obviously, that includes you and I. We work on the internet, so we connect. I use the word millions when you're talking about Twitter, but I, I meant to question you. Are you exaggerating there? I don't know, but you know, I've got like a thousand follows on Substack. I, I, oh, no, most of my stuff doesn't get out to most people, but the, the Epstein file space has had 16 million uh, views over two weeks. Um, that, all right. Of all the different spaces over those two weeks that I was in, yeah. it was about 16 million. Okay, so yeah, that's very big numbers. Don't know, you know I, can't, I won't comment because I don't have any experience. Majority of people won't hear a thing, though, because they'll be too busy flicking to the next thing. So and I mean, and probably are not people, again, because they're getting bots and you know, whatever. Yeah, bots, 100%, 100%. Spider bots. Um, anyway, you got bumped by the system, so somebody wanted you to get bumped, I don't know. But I've, mm. I've generally been... Uh, I've never really built my audience in 30... 30 years of doing this since the early days of the internet i'm constantly changing hats not not deliberately but with hindsight somehow it was strategic because i some part of me doesn't want to have a large audience 
and and this does relate to what I was saying is that you can't connect to a large audience. You so you can you can provide it, uh, media and you can get likes from them, but if they all emailed you, you wouldn't be able to read those emails, much less interact with them on, on an online space. You know, I, I I've done group stuff on Zoom and I never got more than twenty people, and I gave it up because I couldn't even get five people in the end. I think the, you know the deeper I go, the harder it is to find people who are willing to come along. And to me, that's the way it has to be actually because we're getting closer and closer as we've been discussing today to the crunch whereby it gets harder and harder to face up to the reality of what's going on if you haven't already done right if you haven't done the homework up to now you can't catch up you just can't we're we're in post clown world where there are things that people accept without questioning that are actually manifestly insane uh, <laughs> yes, and, yeah. and manifestly evil, right? So, I mean, we could use examples. To me, transgender is a good example of things that absolutely do not make sense that people are claiming, and it's all framed in a humanitarian compassion bundle, and it's completely pernicious and destructive mm -hmm. and evil. So that's one big example to me. Another is what we touched on with World War II, um, which I won't mention any of the keywords because it really can get you taken down. But if you question the narrative around World War II, mm -hmm. so you, you, you we all know jail. here what you're talking about. <laughs> you, you go to jail in 19 countries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same, right? Virtue and, bubbles. Yeah, they but, they create virtue bubbles to protect themselves automatically, so they don't have to have to do any work on it. And well, that's yes, the same with the point, transgender. The point I want to Sorry. make here is that. It's but that those laws have been in place for twenty years or something, and how many people are talking about them? They're not talking about them because they're afraid to. Like it's never mind questioning the narrative, even questioning the fact that people are being thrown in jail for questioning the narrative. People are afraid mm. to do that. So mm. that's really bad. We've got to a really good bad place where people are actually still talking about freedom of speech as if it has existed since world war ii it hasn't yes right? yes hasn't. okay i'm very much on your wavelength here because my all my research says we're so far behind i've said this over and over again you know, we're so we, we we have not got to the party the party's been going on for ages and yeah. we think we think we know what's going on we have no idea yeah. um every time every time that i um go back further in history i realize that most of the 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 things that i've been taught are a lie on base levels principle uh principally like when i say about those virtue bubbles um it we we we, we naturally create like uh we naturally turn to fallacy um in our brain to make logical sense of things when we can't we just like sometimes we just except we're not going to find logic and we just say okay well i can rationalize it this way and so with we, we, our brain naturally creates a fallacy and and that that virtue shield that comes up i'm now complete as soon as someone starts to say like show themselves as a victim of something yeah. i'm suspicious because i've done all of the research into the past now if People want to hear someone who will openly question things like um, uh, what happened during World War uh, Two. You were, you know, they they'll end up with uh, going to people who would be like. Uh, I've had a guy called Corey Hughes uh, on the podcast who writes some very good stuff. He wrote a very good uh, book about uh, the assassination of JFK. But all of these people and like me, we, we very rarely get a space like where we get onto a space where hundreds of thousands or if not millions are going to be watching most of the time the algorithms keep us in the nice little port in a nice little box how do we get out of that box how how you know uh, you're, you're right when you say you try and encourage people to come in and have a conversation and in actual fact most people don't really you know they can't they can't t rationalize what's happening at base levels so uh, i i do think we we are running out of control um and I don't, I don't know where humanity is is going because I think we've lost direction. And the only way out of it seems to be something that there will be, will those, those fictional sort of um, dramas that got created to make these virtue bubbles, so you can't question a certain event, they're going to be 
ever present in the future they're going to yeah. be our our reality becomes that's right well, and that's, that's my point i mean well it's part of my point is is it okay it's one it's just one particular subject today well with covid now obviously it's the same similar similar was happening right in the present with the mrna thing um so we, we are seeing it unfolding but yeah the laws that were created around world war ii and a certain event there they're clearly precedents and they've clearly set a precedent precedent where they're legislating history they have been legislating history since world war ii and of course that means they can legislate in the present what you're allowed to believe in yeah? if you believe in a certain thing that's a criminal offense basically it's what it's saying yeah. or even if you no, I'll, I'll make it an even finer point if you disbelieve in something that's a criminal offense right so to that uh, uh, basically anyone is fair game there's absolutely anything you can get thrown in jail that's revealing the 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 power structure and how it functions and how it operates but we didn't see it like most conspiracy researchers who are supposedly on the cutting edge have not been talking about this because if they have they get called polo deniers that's it mm -hmm. but that's all they are right Mm -hmm. or, and or white supremacists that you it's just very clever though, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very, I, I mean, it's very, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's all effective, all encompassing. It, it's the same uh, strand as just being called a, a, a same, same tool as just being called something like conspiracy theorist. Uh, the majority of people yeah. will just switch off to yeah. what you say that's afterwards. The, that's a thin end, like you and I definitely, like I had a Wikipedia page for a while, it did get taken down, I see. But I think by my family, but I'm not sure. But that did at a certain point that called me a conspiracy theorist, and I'm like, fuck off, right? Because I knew that that's the way it's meant on Wikipedia is don't trust this guy, right? But actually, sure, I'm kind of <laughs> I am a conspiracy theorist. It's, finally... it's kudos, it's kudos from the establishment. They hate you. They they are really angry. The the because uh, really, I I see because they're not they they they're having to lie so much. They're indistinguishable from artificial intelligence. Mm. They 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 don't seem like uh, to to have that humanity, have the moral effort and ethics that, that we know are going to be missing from robots. And that's been um, that's something that's been lifted up and praised and rewarded in our society for so long. Um, but yeah, I, I I I think there's a lot of kudos to be had there. Um, I know about a lot. Um... But it does create this conundrum, uh, which is a very general thing here, but it does sort of relate to the whole subject of AI, really, and the collective, and your question, you know, how to reach people, that, um, yeah, if, if you're able to reach a lot of people through the media, then even if you're not being platformed, you're clearly you're not being cancelled, you're not being censored. So to me, uh, it's, it's a simple math, you're not really threatening anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being a researcher slash conspiracy, whatever, uh, who thinks they're actually going to be threatening the power structures is a ridiculous idea. Because, mm -hmm. as I say, if you are, nobody, you know, you're going to find out and you're going to probably be sorry, not necessarily sorry you did it, but sorry that, you know, you found out, if you know what I mean. You get cancelled, mm -hmm. you get thrown in jail, what have you. You certainly don't end up like Alex Jones or David Icke. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's just yes, ridiculous. Yes, These yeah, guys I... really believe that somehow they're against the, the system or, or Russell Brown, to use a more... Uh, oh yes, for yes, example, yes. right. So, so, so I reconcile that tension, which basically says, if I get too successful, then I'm failing. It's a double bind. Uh, by reminding myself, this isn't about uh, waking anyone up. It isn't about reaching the masses. It's about finding the others, those who actually are willing to look at the truth, no matter how much it ruins their comfortable lives potentially. Yes, uh, yes, because I, I. I I, I can't have a comfortable life. I um I just can't have my my life reporting on facts for the past say, especially for the past four years, as has, has been so uncomfortable all the time, made uncomfortable. <laughs> I can't find regular work. I can't find a place that'll publish my articles. I uh, can't find I, I know that I'm doing the right thing. Well, so I'm gonna that, keep doing that. In that case, you know they say an artist should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Uh, I spend most of my time disturbing the comfortable, but in your case, I'd say 
get get more comfortable, Johnny. You can have some comfort. I mean, you need. Yeah, I know. I know. But I'm trying. Uh, you know, you know the, the fact is, is that even if you if you don't take a side and you try and be objective about everything, yeah. no one wants you because they're That's all right. on the side. That's they right. all yeah. they've all chosen their sides. And uh, the one thing I hear from uh, various platforms that i could work with is oh yes but you know we're trying to attract this person over here and you're you know you're likely to say stuff about them and that that becomes you know the 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 want to be in the gaze and for them to want to increase the amount of people who watch them they will turn to these big characters like alex jones and etc um and i i talked with in these epstein files rooms yeah. um uh, two days in a, a row uh, they had Alex Jones on there and I, I talked to Alex Jones quite a bit in there and the actual what was really interesting is that every single person who was in the room was completely and utterly terrified about talking to him didn't right. know how to, to manage him and they started messaging me behind the scenes saying can you interrupt him please because I was the only one who they had in the room who had the balls to interrupt Alex Jones and lead him onto a pathway he's not talking about grinding up babies and, and elite snorting babies, which then completely and utterly like switches people off to anything else he's said. He says a load of really good I managed to get him talking about Justice Department and you know the evolution of the intelligence and stuff. And he when he actually talks about those things, he's yeah. actually sounds more like a historian. He sounds like a normal person which then makes you realize oh yeah the rest of the thing if you can make him talk about things that are real and yeah. you hear that he's actually got a sensible logical mind he cannot believe half the things he says in reality right. so i mean a lot of these people are just there because and i just give them um the the platforms to be disturbers to disturb the order of things um for so so that people like us uh you know are, got, are bundled with them are put in the same rooms with them are, 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 are attached to them but well, not um, just other researchers but also the, the, you know millions of people that follow alex jones or david ike um because those characters basically stick to a good and evil narrative is the thing so it doesn't matter to the social engineers practicing schismogenesis. It doesn't matter which side you're on. As long as you're on one of the sides, they can they can hurt you. Mm -hmm. That's a really, a really important. A real, I mean, uh, this whole world we're living in right now is like something that that is out of a Kubrick novel. And it, it's because it is really we are <laughs> we are entering into a, a new world. Do you think um what, a, a question on this what what do you think to elon musk then i mean everybody always asks this question what do you what what do you do you think he's just playing a role for the establishment to i, I think it's a good forward? question like as an example because trump obviously is a bigger example the same thing um i think i think the middle way is to say that and because this is true of Hitler in World War Two, like who put Hitler in power, right? The, the, ba the banks and the British and the American allies. And, you know, he was a useful tool for something. And that, you know, that whole process um, did include putting him in power and then knocking him out of power. He served his purpose. Mm -hmm. and then, Right. And of course, then he became the boogeyman of the 20th century. So you could see with hindsight, something like the landscape, and the methodology of, of, of geopolitical social engineering that had a use for somebody like Hitler. So not to compare Trump to Hitler or by, all, by any means, or Elon Musk for that matter, but just in terms of uh, it is possible that somebody can be raised up and then get a bit too big for their boots, mm. uh, even Alex Jones. Uh, but that, that just plays into the plan too, because obviously it makes them more convincing as far as they really are genuinely flies in the ointment or spanners in the works. So it's very yes. hard for many people, even who, who don't admire Trump or they wouldn't vote for him and they don't think he's a savior or Elon Musk. It's, it's very hard for a lot of those people to just think that uh, he's not doing something to piss some people off because the theater is very persuasive. And I'm saying it might not be entirely theater. It may be 
yeah, okay, Musk, these are the, or Hitler or Trump, these are the things we'll give you, and this is what we want in return. And once they get a bit of power, they start welshing, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they start it's welch welch <laughs> they don't they don't follow through uh and then and so then they have to be cut down to size but that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that they're only there because they can be controlled and handled and if they ever really get out of line then then, then well i was going to say then we'll know it but actually even that's unclear because alex jones it would seem as though, well, that was very legitimizing because he got he got deplatformed and all the rest of it. But when you're as big as Alex Jones, uh, what you need more more than platform is uh, is credibility. Mm -hmm. So Alex Jones can create a platform wherever he goes, as long as they can't ban him from the internet, which they can't yet. He can still get millions of people, and now he's got more credibility than he had before. So I would say that's probably whether he knows it or not. That's probably yeah. We do need Alex Jones, but the landscape's changing. So and and also they've got to send a consistent message. I mean, it works both ways. They basically are trying to shut down a lot of people out there who are questioning things, the, the ones that they can't use as honeypots. Um, so they have to have a consistent message. But then it has this this complementary function of giving more credibility to the ones that they feel are useful. I would say, you know, uh, I mean, it's interesting that you actually spoke to Alex Jones because I'm sure if I could speak to him, I'd have an entirely different perspective. I don't have anything against Alex Jones. I just think that whether he knows it or not, or David Icke, uh, the kind of dissemination of information he uses, he employs is useful overall to the the you know social engineering the schismogenesis it can be used because there's there's very little nuance in it it doesn't actually challenge people so that they will do their own introspection their own exploration come to their own conclusions they'll just go baby snorting evil elite i've got to get on that bandwagon because i definitely don't want to end up you know on the wrong side of of, of alternate history right Mm -hmm. I, I I was surprised. He, what what I discovered is that he uh, kept using the term astute with my my what with what I I I could uh, what what I was saying to him, but that was partially because I was um I, I, I when you get into a, a platform and a stage like that and you get to talk with someone who's had that much experience with these, you've got to be careful anyway because you can't. Uh, if I was to to go in for an attack on him well that's a man who understands attacks and why would i want mm. to attack him because he's a just another cog in the machine of things but i wanted to test his knowledge in other areas and what i was really you know was really telling to me was how he um responded intellectually uh, he seemed like he it, it makes the other stuff look like what it is the creation of a character yeah. um once once you uh get them off that track and yeah. distract them with real world and they start talking about the real world in real terms yeah. um oh i i also found it interesting i mean i ended up talking with rudy giuliani as well um mm -hmm. i i know and and but i had just um finished an uh, like a documentary series uh which is based on an article where the second uh, a few articles in the pottinger series and the second article actually giuliani giuliani is the one who lets this guy pottinger off the investigation like doesn't investigate him um uh about uh, iran contra and mm -hmm. smuggling guns with Jeffrey Epstein and I managed to ask him about that and and his reaction was very um very oh well, no I, I don't remember that at all you know you know we just just mm, well. uh, uh, but it, it these people aren't used to being put in situations where people have the confidence to question them because mm. like I say the majority of people there are really and even myself are really super respectful to the the big platforms and how they built their platforms it would take me maybe a few days to get through to to having a conversation with alex jones to be able to 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 come to the same point where i'd be like uh, he's exactly as i expect him to be uh, yeah. mostly bombast mostly 
assholery. <laughs> Sorry to say that. I think there's a yeah, there's a double challenge. And not I've really spoken to any major big wigs, but one is what you're saying. They're very highly high status, and that is intimidating, no matter who you are, pretty much. Um, but the other is you. I would feel I didn't know how much I could trust them to be honest, and it's yeah. very difficult if you think. Somebody who's a politician or a high-level entertainer, Jordan Peterson would also be similar. Just somebody who's been that raised up, you know they must have been co-opted whether they know it or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you don't know, do they know it or do they not? Yeah, 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 they know if they it, don't yeah, know yeah. it, they don't want to hear it. And if they do know it, they'll just lie. So you kind of, oh, yeah. what's the point? You just can't yeah. know it at all. That's what I do in my journalism. I try and subvert, subvert that I'm actually... um. Uh, I'm actually doing something about Jordan Peterson at the moment, which is very, very, because, because, you know, he's a very, he's a good example of what we're talking about here. The ability to give yourself um, a, a sort of presentation that is acceptable to the majority of people you want to communicate with um, and, and to, to be then uh, become such a big influencer and uh, you know I, I i looked back into his family history and i wanted to know you know it, this this sort of he gives himself off as oh we were norwegian immigrants who came over our family was norwegian immigrants who came over to to find a new life in the americas and then canada and you know and i'm just a normal guy from alberta and all of this but i never believe that story if you're up there on the high levels then um you've got to have 18 pages of nights in your family history at least because yeah. that's where i've got to so far 18 pages but people will be able to to find out that research on it uh, yeah. when it comes out the, yeah. these people are always related to the upper echelons of power and it's the information that they guard to keep themselves up there wow. and we're entering into a world where artificial intelligence is is creating the information for them um and they, i think that we're, we're on the point where they're about to lose the 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 ability to keep hiding all of that information as well um do you think that if we lose this battle and artificial intelligence starts running the show, we start relying it for everything, which is exactly what we could probably expect to happen. Um, do you think that that will be good for the elites? No, I don't. Well, are they creating their own the, death? Well, yeah, because obviously uh, maybe we want to be careful about using a term to describe a bunch of people we don't really know no yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i mean the downfall of the yeah. establishment uh of of the the in the, the the current establishment the death of the current establishment rather than the death of people individually yeah but what what i was going to qualify is, is that um i mean we don't really know what's driving the agendas that are apparently being driven by the elite, or could say we don't know what's driving the elite who are seemingly driving the agendas. So uh, to my mind, what's driving the elite is also what's empowering the elite, which is Satan slash trauma, just to keep it simple so I can get to my next point. It's not something good. Um, so therefore, if they were to to the extent that they could succeed, and it's, I think it's absolutely limited, but uh, it's they're not really going to um, get to enjoy the benefits of it. Um, I mean, you're talking about your discomfort. I have a feeling because you know I could say I'm quite uncomfortable in many ways too. Like I'm always questioning and doubting, and I'm definitely not complacent. Uh, I'm comfortable in, in, in ways I think are natural and healthy, like in my body and my diet and just walking in nature and my marriage is reasonably stress-free uh, and so on. <laughs> Be got, careful, yeah, don't make it more stress. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got enough comfort, I'd say, and, you know, I watch ordinary TV shows in the evening and, and so on. Um, but uh, I do have a certain element of dissatisfaction that keeps me banging away you know work going into things and it motivates me so i think it's probably you know a tolerable or a reasonable amount of dissatisfaction but i think when we're talking about the quote elite unquote i think they're driven by such deep chronic dissatisfaction that essentially they want to kill their souls and uh 
and think that somehow they get relief if they can completely destroy their souls or cut off all connection to their souls, they get relief. Well, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. So, and this this does extend to the all of humanity that we've all been infected with this virus that somehow. Uh, because there's discomfort in, in the body uh, and in the deep unconscious and in the emotions and just being present and interacting with nature and other human beings, because it's uncomfortable, we look for more and more distractions and escape mechanisms and dissociative strategies. And so we we, we sign up for disembodiment. Um, and it, no, it doesn't, doesn't lead to a good place for anyone. Uh, so, so no, is, is your answer. I mean, there's no, I don't see there's any uh, real victory possible here when you're, when you're pitted against life. I mean, okay, or God even, how can you win that battle? You can't. You can just prolong the agony of trying to resist nature, life, the divine. Uh, it's a bad situation for everybody, but it's much worse for the people who are really... Um, driving this you know who've become the main instruments of this organized malevolence obviously we we could if we really wanted to extend our imagination and our compassion we could see that those are the ones most in need of compassion i don't necessarily go there because you know i have a hard time having compassion for my wife never mind for the elite <laughs> I, <laughs> I know my you're getting yourself in all sorts of trouble if you're not careful <laughs> no nah, she's heard it all <laughs> said, oh, and I've learned just not to pretend. It's just the main thing is not to pretend that we're more virtuous than we are. Yeah. Uh, just, just let ourselves be as fucked up as we are, and just work, you know, work with that. Not, not even work on it. Just work with it, and uh, you know, not, not be as good as we can be, but just be as honest as we can be about that, about our limitations. Uh, and again, you know, that's about engaging with other people and with physical reality you're constantly coming up against your limits uh but it's good isn't it? it may not be fun this is why i picked uh, the book of job as my uh sort of reference point or launching point for the substat because that book of job contains a parable really if i'd say for the human situation which is we are estranged from god we don't know what god's doing god up there on high is making bets with the devil and doing all kinds of weird things and in fact you know the bad things that happen have got nothing to do with our own sinfulness they're just kind of the way that you know existence is unfolding there's a there's a big thing is being worked out here on these mm -hmm. levels that we can't possibly understand um but the main thing is is to um be willing to stand up and be counted uh and to to refer primarily to our own sense of uh what is true as the thing in the book of job is he's saying why why is all these bad things happening he doesn't know that god made a bet with satan because satan said if that's your best man i bet i can turn him against you right um and all his friends are telling him the bad things are happening because you're bad and job is saying no i know that's not true you know i'm not perfect but i know i didn't do anything to deserve this so i want to talk to god i want to hear what god has to say Right? that's his position and that that seems like a good position whether or not god will ever come and tell us as he does with job that's it's all a metaphor but we do mm -hmm. there is a there is a, an inner compass that tells us the difference between right and wrong but that's the audience with god i'd say the soul if we can find the way to refer to that uh, consult with that we don't have to worry about anything else because if your soul says you're all right that's god saying you're all right so okay i'm all right you have to it's every second mm -hmm. you have to check in um anyway i mean that was that was a, a big uh ambling around the brambles really wasn't it I can't, your question was about the elite uh about... I, well my, my 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 thought on the original um point of what i was trying to make is really they're creating an infrastructure where intelligence will no longer be in their hand and information will no longer be in their hands. They won't be able to control it anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're making that point. You see, because I think that, I think the practical point is, is that the internet was always controlled from the beginning. It was, it was a weapon that's been used um, 
Oh, it's been employed. I, I chuckle because Usenet existed before the internet. So we well, use DARPA. it. Is, yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, the DARPA, of course, was a military intelligence thing. Um, but with the awareness that it could be used against, you know, the, the controllers would know that they were providing this tool, just like the printing press before, that could definitely undermine the structures of power that were installed in society. So they would have known, let's say, to say they is a bit tricky, but it would have been known that uh, it would have to be a real changing of the landscape. The methods of control would have to become very, very different. And one of the obvious examples is they can't control information anymore, so they flood us with information. So then that creates a different kind of fog if you will you've got the fog of lies that we talked about where you can't even find out find the truth then you've got the fog of too much uh information flooding the zone right alternate things you don't know what to believe this is what happened with covid you could you could pr provide all the data you could find for somebody and they'd say well look i've got my source and that their source says the opposite and they're just saying well that all sources are created equal which obviously isn't true mm -hmm. uh but most people are now too lazy, and understandably, because as you've just testified, you can spend your whole life just checking sources, never mind compiling them. You've got to check them as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most people are far too lazy slash busy for that. So basically, if somebody can create a convincing enough piece and or if it's what they want to hear, that's it. They'll just say, well, I've got my source, you've got yours. Well, mm -hmm. that's not an argument. That's just saying... Basically, it's postmodernism, right? I've got my truth, you've got your truth, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relativism so, as well. So it's sort of the battle's won then at a certain point cognitively. Um, but I don't see that as a bad thing. So in terms of the internet, the question then is, how well can we use it while we've got it? Uh, how is it going to be taken away? You know, But what, what sort of incremental stages, what's it going to look like? And how far are we willing to compromise uh, you know to to not have it taken away individually and then what are we going to do without it those are the three questions that i'm going to pose and of course the fourth point then is uh, or where point three question three leads to is are we ready to live without the internet because we mm. you know, a generation that was uh, became addicted you know, whatever human humanity got addicted to something within one generation really like it seems ind indispensable to us yeah yeah. That's a matter. Well, I said that's a good way to start to to a uh, good place to start to roll it down. I I remember um a couple of weeks ago I was watching a uh, it was some clip on Twitter or whatnot, uh, some quick short, but it was um a video of people in the nineties at uh, uh, an event where they're all just standing around. They could, None of them have got mobile phones. None of them have got that sort of stuff. And they're all just standing around. And they're mo mo mostly not talking to each other. They're just existing, you know? Mm -hmm. They're just chilling. They're just being. And and that's what's being taken away from us, the being. The, hu the, the, the being out of human being mm -hmm. is being taken away. We're, we're being converted to humans and then to, uh, of course robots eventually that's what they 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 want to incorporate that yeah well i think world. i think somehow the human doing got lost in there as well because because human beings were once also human doings uh as in i say about farming you talk about barn building you get your, your village together to build a barn that's such a community uh, soul building experience there are all kinds of doings that we had over the, mm. uh, the centuries that were just absolutely healthy ways of being but we've actually been given all these doings which they're not really doings because they don't facilitate being they're more like buyings or mm. leavings or receivings or ingestings or consumings right where we've, we've bindings doing... yeah yeah they're bind literally us. bindings by yeah, binding habits, addictions, whatever they turn us into receptacles essentially. Like you talk about consumers, that's part of it, but it's deeper than that. It's like your human be being has been turned into a into a sort of expressive function of the soul, like bees making honey, into this uh, demonic receptacle that's just supposed mm -hmm. to receive, you know, the goods, whatever it is, uh, the media, 
uh, and then eventually the the uh, technological jab that goes into your bloodstream and turns you into a human rubber factory or whatever that doesn't happens. even need to be a jab i mean the technology then increasing you know we talk about terms like chemtrails and stuff well we we know that they were they were spraying um zinc cadmium sulfide all over britain all over britain they were spraying this with a coli all over britain for years and years and years they recorded it in their own you know it's all come out in in hearings etc um yeah. as in inquests so we 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 know we know it all happened and we were yeah. being told we were crazy at the time well that was that'll be the same once we've got some sort of nanotechnology that people don't realize they won't even see it get into your body they won't even see and that's the end of that is truly the end of humanity i think the end of humanity is humanity always ends with hubris that's it it always ends with this idea that we're above we we, we know best and the, the 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 thing that i think but me and you we'd share probably from our research um is the acceptance of becoming of being wrong quite a lot because, I mean, when you research stuff, there's a lot of times where you come across stuff and go, oh, my God, my whole vision of what I saw the world like has changed with just a couple of fundamental pieces of information. And again, yeah. Yeah. we're in flux. Yeah, uh, Jason, did, can you tell people uh, where they can buy your, your books and where they can get your stuff and where they can read your work? Well, they can buy my books at landmademan.com if they go to there they'll find a section with all the books listed with no links to amazon obviously they can do what they want but i provided alternate links they can buy audiobooks from me directly for big mother kubrickon vice of kings prisoner of infinity and 16 maps of hell 16 maps of hell i've only got three hardback copies left because it was a limited run uh and they're like 360 euro each so i might have them and be on my desk i did sell one for 700 euro recently so you never know and um beyond that then i have a weekly uh podcast called the job cast uh the children of job which by the way on hubris uh the tagline there is the place where faith and hubris meet mm-hmm. and this is back to job is my sense is, you know, he gets accused of hubris by his friends. But when God comes down, he says, no, Job, he spoke rightly about me. Job was saying, you know, I'm an asshole and you can't trust me. Well, Job was right. You guys, you're a bunch of losers and you're going to have to ask Job to pray for your forgiveness. So there's something about, yeah, too much faith is not good. You, you, we need we do need this element of just standing up for our own sense of who we are, even in the face of you know, being condemned by everyone around us, like trusting that that God can express through us without having to mm-hmm. refer or refer to some external authority. Anyway, that's why I say it's the place where faith and hubris meet. And uh, that that's where all my activity is, is at the Substack. So I've been actually finally, for the first time, earning a living writing, because you can't earn a living writing. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. You write the kind of books I write anyway. Um, so it's it's paid, but there's, I do a lot of free material there. I do an essay every Wednesday and a podcast every Saturday. And I'm currently doing a series about this subject that I didn't want to name today because I don't want to mm-hmm. get you banned from YouTube. Um, but yeah, what, what's going on around there, around these stories that we've been told and how much have we been defined by them and how much do we need to take apart the stories to get a little bit closer to what's true. It's one thing to acknowledge that we keep getting it wrong, but it's another which is healthy and good. Um, But we also have to recognize that we can get closer to being right. You just have to keep banging away. And part of it is knowing, well, we'll probably never get to be completely objectively right, but at least compared to how I was yesterday, Right, I'm I'm getting wiser. If, if if wisdom doesn't come with age, then what's the point in getting old? Beautiful, beautiful way to end it there. Thank you very much, Jason, for coming on the Newspeak podcast. Thanks, Johnny. I enjoyed it very much. Young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, 
president of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets.